This is Mike Goldberg, the voice of Bellator MMA. Great to be podside once again. Set to enter the podcast right now. Our tale of the tape, the current undefeated champion of the world, Captain Hooter, defending his title once again. And I can tell you, no champion has ever defended his podcast this many times. Well, since podcast began. Can he do it again? Let's find out. Here we go. It's Captain Hooter. <laughs> All right, what's happening, everyone? Hooter here. Coming to you once again, very high, and very alive from my beautiful virtual mushroom room tonight. You know, tonight, I have some legit killer media coming in tonight. Serious. We're going to have a chance to talk to the editor-in-chief, the roaming editor-in-chief, of Fat Nugs Magazine. Dude, Dustin Hawksworth. Actually, technically, he's the creator, executive, editor-at-large of Fat Nugs Magazine. And, dude, can you tell already, he is going to be a fantastic interview. We are about to have a blast, dude. Check this out, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Hola, hola, everyone. Captain Hooter here. And today I'm excited because I have brought some media, some real media, something you can sink your teeth into. I have with us Dustin Hawksworth. He's the founder and editor-at-large of Fat Nugs Magazine, baby. Dustin, how are you, sir? Thank you. Welcome. I'm great, man. Thanks for having me, dude. <laughs> That's a great intro. I love it. Oh, dude. Well, it's you. You are, you know, one of the things I love, editor-at-large. Okay, what the hell is the difference between an editor and an editor-at-large, number one? Sure. So you have your editor-in-chief, right? Those are the those are the ones that really provide like the meat and potatoes of, of, of what a publication does. They're the ones who take those articles in or that content in and, and fix it up to make it right. Um, what I do is uh, I can do a little bit of that if I have to, but I tend not to. And basically what an editor at large does is sort of be the voice um, and I guess the face of the publication or the magazine or the media you know, company, whatever. Okay. And so, um, you know, I'm supposed to go to shows and expos and uh, do interviews and, and that kind of stuff. So that's basically what the at-large part is. Fantastic. And yeah. Fat Nugs Magazine. First of all, love the, my favorite name ever of a magazine. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> right on. It does make you kind of smile when you say it. I mean, sure, it's kind of silly, right? But that's the whole point. It's it's hard to be in a bad mood when you say fat nugs. It's just like, you know, okay, we're going to start this shit out positive regardless. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And, you know, and right away, as soon as I, I discovered you, just so you know, I discovered you on LinkedIn. And I, I discovered you from a series of bam, 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 really awesome, significant, and impactful writing and comments and i went whoa okay something's going on here and then i started doing the trail back and uh and 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 i'm i'm just fascinated by how you how did you end up at this magazine you were uh you were in the industry right in the entertainment industry yeah i was in the film industry before i before i got into the legal side of cannabis but you know my my, I guess my life with cannabis started a very, very long time ago. So I have 22 family members that are either current or former military. And mm -hmm. as everyone was coming home from Vietnam, we had a ton of issues, right? Health, PTSD, that kind of stuff, even though we had no idea what PTSD was back then. Um, so weed was smoked constantly in my family from the earliest moments of my life that I can remember it's my parents and my aunts and uncles and, you know, family, friends, all smoking constantly. So it was always normalized in my family. Uh, and as you and I were talking about a little bit earlier, I grew up with an indigenous stepfather as well for nine years, who was also a consumer. And let's just say I saw some plants around the house every now and then. Uh, I ended up putting myself through college as well by running pounds from Atlanta, Georgia, down to Georgia Southern University to pay for my school. 
So it helped me get my college education. It was also the same time, uh, 1995, that I uh, began consuming on a daily basis and, and, and really understanding why my family was consuming back then when I was young. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it. So that's really kind of where my, my, my cannabis stuff started. Uh, and, and then, you know, went into after school 14 years in uh, corporate world. Uh, I did time in the corporate world for 14 years. Uh, and then ended up in the film industry for the last four years or so, where I got to work on some really killer stuff. And um, after that, I think it was because of the pandemic. And I think a lot of us sort of have this, right, where the pandemic sort of shut down most of everything, um, except for the cannabis industry, you know, luckily enough. And so I decided because the film industry was, was stopped totally. So um, I decided to do a couple of other things. And then I said, you know what? I need to be doing something that I really love. I ended up opening up LinkedIn one day. And for some reason, I don't know what happened, but I saw the biggest plant, the biggest cola on my phone I had ever seen. And I was like, what in the fuck is this? What is going on? Why am I seeing this on LinkedIn on my phone? So I dove into, because I had no idea that the, the cannabis industry actually lived on LinkedIn as much as it does. I had no idea that the cannabis industry was even really a thing on LinkedIn at all. Mm -hmm. So I dove into the post and real quickly realized like, oh my God, this is, this is like, people are serious. I can't believe that this is actually on LinkedIn. And this was really just over about, oh, maybe a year, year and a half ago or so, whenever that was, a little over a year yep. ago, maybe that I was... I started to do this. And from that moment, I realized, okay, I, I finally get to come out of the green closet on a, in my professional world, you know, my professional life for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to sort of bring my love, uh, passion, knowledge, consumption of the plant for my entire life, um, which by the way, I had to hide when I was in the corporate world. We, will, we live those dual lives, right? Yep. We, we, we put on our suits and go be the douchebag for the day. So you can come home and rip the bong at night. <laughs> uh, at least that's what I did. Yes. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of us go through that, but anyway, I, so I started to, uh, combine sort of my, na my, my, my natural inclination of the plant, so to speak, and my corporate knowledge throw my own silly, quirky self on top of it or my personality on top of it and start to post and start to engage and start to network and start to connect. But, you know, because of, I guess, the way that I, I am normally, uh, I'm sort of a chatterbox at times, right? I can talk to a brick wall at times. I like to have fun. I like to smoke weed. I like to connect with people. I like to do shit. Yeah. So I'm fairly active. So I would get involved in conversations. I would make sure that I'm you know, diving in and, and I truly care what people have to say about the plant. I learn as much as I can on a daily basis from people that know a shit ton more than I do, even though I've been around the plant since I was born, basically, right? So, you know, it's, um, LinkedIn was a really cool spot for me to be able to step into and start to develop uh, more of a voice, um, which is kind of weird and mind blowing to me. I don't, I, I don't quite understand it. So no, about it's not to me. It's not to I, me, dude. You I, I did the same it. thing. I did the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's it's weird. Dude, I watch all of these cool ass people all over social media uh, when it comes to cannabis and I'm like this it's so cool to see really dope people doing really dope things with weed. Yeah. Um it it's it's um it's just something that is me being here in the south in Atlanta um, even though it's decriminalized here in the city, but here being in the South, it's not like it's out in the open, right? So it's so nice to see people doing really cool stuff all over the place when you get online. So it's, um, it's sort of a surprise to me, but it, it's, um, I, it is very cool to be a part of. So about four and a half months ago or so, um, I started wanting to come up with a way to, to talk to my network and my connections in a different way. And I thought there was no better place for me to do this than LinkedIn. So how Fat Nugs came about, the name was, you know, sort of our vernacular, right? That's a fat sack. Those are fat buds. Those are fat nugs. That's a fat joint. That's a fat blunt. And it just kind of, I was like, okay, well, fat nugs makes sense. I made sure it didn't exist. Although there's a nugs, mm -hmm. a fat nugs does not exist. So I was like, yep, okay, that works. So from there, I just started um, creating these covers 
that looked like magazine covers. And because I'm sort of a artsy fartsy dude, I guess I'm a relatively creative person, always looking for sort of a creative dump. I, I have written and released three albums. I paint, I blah, blah, blah. So um, it was a way for me to sit around and do something fun and creative for myself while I'm stoned at night, to be honest with you, is how it started. And I created these covers with hopefully some decent headlines uh, that people might want to talk about, think about, you know, whatever the case may be. And I would post one. Mm -hmm. And the very first one that I posted, it got such a huge response. And I was like, what the hell did I just do? And it was, I honestly had no idea. I, I was just like, okay, cool. This was fun. You know, I, I made a cover and the response, it really took me by surprise so much so that I, I couldn't even catch up to the DMS on LinkedIn. I was like, holy shit, this is crazy. And it was people like, how do I get this? Where do I find this? Can you send this to me? How much does this cost? What, you know what I mean? And I was like, wow, that was unbelievable. So it just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. The light. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Dude, it's, and it's, you know, you oh, know what, what, what ended up happening was after the third one that I post. So every Friday, I call it fat nugs Friday. And I do something for fat nugs focused every Friday on LinkedIn. So essentially I've built this magazine through LinkedIn, um, through connections, through networking, that kind of stuff. So after the third one that I posted, a couple of cannabis media companies came to me and said, we would love to bring this in house. And I was like, well, what do you mean? It's not real. Like I've always had to respond to people like this isn't real. It's, it's fun for me. It's a creative dump. You know, this, there are no articles attached to these headlines. There's, there's nothing behind this cover. Mm -hmm. And I was quickly made to realize that what I was doing was sort of filling a gap. Uh, in a couple of different ways, whether it be from an artistic standpoint or sort of being that bridge of cannabis and stoner culture to corporate culture as I sort of am, I guess, because I found myself in that situation. Um, but I said, oh, okay, I get it. And so it, it, then it really started to snowball and the, the community kind of came together around it. And now here we are, man. Boom. Just like that. Yeah, sort of fascinating, to be honest with you. And that was only about four and a half months ago. And I just saw the first printed issue last night. I was like, oh my God, it's crazy. <laughs> well, I've been tracking this since you started putting some of your first ones out there and watching this whole process. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm old school. And, you know, I was one of those guys that used to, I learned how to use a Heidelberg press. I used to set type. We used to help. I worked at a print shop that helped work for Palm Springs Life magazine. And nice. I used to watch the entire process from beginning to end. You know, I knew the writers and the photographers and, and you know, I knew the whole process. So I know what a nightmare <laughs> putting together a magazine. It can and, be. It, it yeah. really can be at times. But I'll tell you what, man. And, and you know what? It's, it's funny you say that. So, you know, this publication really comes from three things from my childhood. And you're talking about you've worked at other magazines and things like that you know, the other magazines that come to mind are from my childhood that this thing really kind of is trying to embody that eventually I'm going to hit that holy grail that says, ah, that's what I was looking for. Right. So, uh, you know, I was a little skater punk when I was, when I was little. So, oh, cool. uh, uh, oh yeah, dude. So Thrasher magazine was everything, right. I mean, it's fucking, there was nothing better than opening up that magazine and seeing a dude doing a mick twist in your face that covered a double page yeah. spread, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, man, that's so cool. So the other one, I can remember walking around grocery stores with my mom when I was young and seeing Mad Magazine in, in the in the magazine section and always being so enthralled by that goofy looking redhead freckled dude on front, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, um, of course, high times from 70s, 80s, and early 90s, you know, when they, in, in, in my view, in their heyday, uh, when they were really putting out, you know, rad content, you know, different stuff, really focused on culture stuff, not the super paid media stuff that we tend to see these days. And I'm not criticizing anyone. Everybody has to do their thing. I get it. Um, but it was definitely different back then. So really, th those three publications kind of mixed into one is sort of what I am 
going for as much as possible. Obviously, it's going to have my own twist on it. But yeah, there we go. I love it. You know, I, I was, uh, again, you used excellent examples there. Uh, I had a chance, I've had a chance to meet Steve Hager one, two, three times. Yeah. And, how'd uh, that go? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so listen, I love this man. And, and I'll tell you my very first time I met him, I met the very first time I met him was at the 1991 uh, Cannabis Cup, I believe it was. Was it two? Yeah, I think it was ninety-one. Mm, boy, it doesn't sound right though. Anyway, we were we were in Amsterdam. We were in a big room. There was about four hundred and fifty people that were in this big room. I was sitting with my wife uh, next to Chef Ra. Do you remember Chef Ra? I don't. Okay, uh, you can Google him later, and that's also a character or a person who you'd love to be able to replicate in your magazine. If I can make a suggestion. Fair um, enough. Chef Ra was somebody who in every episode was coming up and showing you some amazing kind of new uh, recipe of how to cook with wheat. Okay. And, and, he, and the funny part is he was Chef Makes Ra. Makes sense. <laughs> he was Chef Ra. Everybody thought he was a Jamaican and he wasn't. He was uh, East Coast. And, uh, <laughs> and, and the day that I saw him, Steve Hager came in and uh, it, in, the, in the middle of all of this room, all of the possible things that you could say to anyone. And his first comment to the entire room was, hey, everybody, just wanted to let you know, when you take a hit of weed from your joint or from your pipe, you don't have to hold it for 10 seconds to get the effect. <laughs> you can just inhale it, and blow it right out, and you've got it. Yeah. Peace. Right. And like every 15, 20 minutes or so, there'd be some <laughs> other piece of, of, and it was, it was all good. You know, that's it was funny. All like great stuff. Well, he wasn't lying, by the way. I mean, it was good. It was good information, at least. Right. Dude, the stories that he could tell oh, I bet. Um, are, are, are crazy. But um, the important part are the stories that you're going to be able to tell. So tell me, give me an idea. Um, Cause you know, the idea of even having Fat Nugs <laughs> magazine and all the possibilities of what sure. you could do are sure. endless. So oh, yeah. give me an idea of what kind of things we can kind of look forward to. Oh, yeah. So I'll give you the general direction of the magazine first. I think that'll help. So we have sort of a global perspective on cannabis and stoner culture. We have writers that are in Kenya, um, Scotland, Ireland, Spain, Canada, Bermuda, and of course here in the U.S. So you get a pretty good perspective from a lot of different types of people and cultures, right? Mm -hmm. Very inclusive as well. Our writer, we have th at least three LGBTQ plus writers. We have um, just about every type of person you can think of writing, to be honest with you. I mean, hell, our, our editor in chief is um, uh, absolutely amazing, obviously a woman. Um, as well. So we're as inclusive as we can possibly be. So what you're going to see is a pretty wide variety of personal stories around cannabis, around cannabis use, around education, around science. So we don't necessarily, what's, what I think is really cool is a lot of people talk about us being like opinion, aid, uh, opinion pieces, right? That's not really even what we're doing. It's um, we have a lot of just personal stuff mixed in with our culture, stoner culture, cannabis culture, and then science, education, um, you know, mothers uh, you know, with cannabis, you know, cannabis use and, and, and all of that kind of stuff, how to bring up your children around cannabis use, you know, those types of things as well. And then, of course, I like to focus on um, as much small mom and pop legacy or traditional owned, women owned, equity owned cannabis businesses and people as well. So I try to highlight yes. that as much as possible. Um, I have a legacy spotlight series that I do where I have asked, which is, um, you know, very cool of a lot of people around the country to be able to be comfortable with this because we know we've always been sort of a subculture and, and, and very quiet in what we do when we grow, right? It's, it's for instance, here in Georgia, I know several growers, nobody knows who they are. You know what I mean? So it's very quiet. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I've been By very- way, quick, quick, quick interruption, because I've been yeah. thinking about it three times. How's the weed in Georgia? Uh, what I'm smoking is absolutely amazing because it's local, fresh, never touched a bag or jar, you know, that type oh, of stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, so yeah, it's, uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the grower, the Legacy Spotlight series that was in the July edition, it's that guy. Oh. <laughs> it's, that's the weed I'm smoking right now. Nice. Yeah. Okay. But okay. you know, in general, I mean, in general, I think it's pretty much like it is everywhere when it comes to the traditional or legacy market at this point, where a lot of it probably comes from California. It falls off the truck from somewhere that's legal, right? Oklahoma is probably another spot as well at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so you're getting mostly probably decent mids, um, you know, spread across the state at this point. Luckily, I don't have that problem. So um, how are the prices? Prices, uh, 200 bucks an ounce. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, so uh, I, I think fair for, for all involved, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you can grow it for cheap and get it for cheaper, but if you want quality, if you want the shit that I'm smoking, it's going to be, you know, around $200 an ounce. Mm -hmm. Wow. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, what were we talking about? <laughs> I <totally. laughs> I'm sorry. I, I had to get in because it's like, I, I talk to people all around and, you know, one of the, the parts of my show is a thing called a worldwide bud report. And I get people to give me reports from uh, of what kind of buds are smoking. I like that. Different like kinds that. of levels of, a, a, I've got some interpreters uh, and I, I'm just about to add a ganjir. I love having interpreters. Ah. I'm an interpreter also. Uh, nice. By the way, that's another person, if you want to have a great interview, Max Montrose, the man who is the head of the Tricom Institute. One Ooh. of the most amazing interviews you may ever have. And he's growing, uh, he's up in Oregon right now, growing a sacred cactus and Ooh. all kinds of uh, mm. psychedelics and nice. uh, other elements. There's a nice parlay. Now tell me, how is it that we're, we're uh, psychedelics doing in Georgia? Are, are we able to microdose here, there yet? Uh, no, hell no, not legally, hell no. Um, hell but no, every, boy. <laughs> no, but, every, but everybody does, right? I mean, yeah. at this point, I think psychedelics are at least, excuse me, certain psychedelics are easier to get a hold of than almost anything else. Really? Uh, oh yeah, they're, they're everywhere. And you can get them in just about any form that you want from fresh to you know ground up in a capsule. Oh. To chocolates. I mean, honestly, I have... Um, yeah, so my birthday was a couple of weeks ago and uh, my, my lady happened to run across three nice size psilocybin chocolate bars from Holland. Oh. So, you know, you can get them from just about anywhere these days. They're, they're around. Mm -hmm. oh, it is and they're good. The, it is one of the booming markets. And uh, I've, had oh, several yeah. I've had several people on the show uh, who are uh, experts. Ian Bollinger runs the uh, psilocybin cup out of California. Ooh, and nice. uh, yeah, he's an, another one of the guys you might want to have an interview. He is brilliant and uh, has a lot, a ton of information about the details of how you would actually judge mushrooms, which is, sure, that, you know, that, that would be a, mind blowing for me. Yeah, that yes. would be, I mean, what? <laughs> exactly. It, that's cool. No, I, I like that though. That's, um, I would love to learn more about that. And I appreciate all of the uh, suggestions, by the way. No, it, well, it's like I said, I've kind of got a little history in, in this whole magazine uh, element. I was, I was I so excited because again, when I saw it, I went, dude, there it is. Now we <laughs> finally, and, and let me just tell you, it takes some big balls to do this. Okay. There's, look at all the magazines that have. Why? I don't understand why, man. I'll tell you what. It, it, I'll, I'll let you answer that here in a second. Okay. So, you know, I think that it has, I think creating a publication of really any sort sort of has this aura about it, right? Because a lot of us grew up with magazines and we think they're, they're, they're fairly special in our culture. They're fairly special around the world. They just are. It's another work of art if it's done correctly. Yes. So it's, it's, um, I get the sort of feeling that from people that this could be a super difficult thing. Holy shit. You're taking on a lot of stuff, that kind of, of thinking, but I'll be totally honest with you, man, because of the way that it started, because it was just like a, a little passion thing for me where I was creatively dumping and posting so that I could talk to people, man, to connect with people. 
you know, make something that people would stop scrolling for a second and go, well, that's fucking cool. You know, that's, and, and it, so it came from just, uh, I, I wasn't looking to make money off of it. I guess that's yeah. what I'm trying to get at. It was just like art, you know, it was just passion art is stuff. all it was. It's passion stuff. And it was about weeds. And I love to talk about weed and smoke weed and blah, blah, blah. So why not? So everything that's followed has sort of fallen into place through a lot of hard work. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. And times where I've been up for way too long on weekends, on Sunday nights and blah, blah, blah. But it's all been with a smile on my face because the people that I get to interact with, work with, interview, write articles with, edit stuff with, Caitlin, my, the, the editor in chief, everybody I get to interact with has made this thing actually work. The community has made the work work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they've taken on a lot of the responsibility of, of making sure the magazine is successful because they love cannabis. And that's what we're doing. We're uplifting the plant. We're, we're giving a voice or trying, I'm doing my best to elevate as many cannabis and stoner culture voices as I can uh, from a natural standpoint from their mouth not me going I want you to talk about this I, no I want you to tell me what you want to talk about and then let me push that shit out that's how I'm doing this so it's created this thing of community and I think you and I were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier so what we end up doing when we have a new contributor is we invite them into the community by adding them to a Slack channel. We send them information in an email to get them started saying, this is when we need stuff. This is what we're looking for. This is what we're about. You know, all positive energy here, all of that kind of stuff. And we've created, or we've tried to create a gathering of like these super different, cool weirdos and cannabis folks that just do cool shit. And so we talk about stuff and we write about stuff. And now we have some sort of a platform to actually speak from our hearts and passion and love for the plant so that we can continue to uplift the plant instead of it always being about, you know, the money portion of the plant um, or, you know, some cannabis, big cannabis company paying a publication to say, hey, put me that CEO on the front cover and, and you're going to give me an advertorial in there that tells everybody how awesome my company is and shit like that. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that stuff. Yes, we do paid advertising where you get a full page advertisement to show people your shit. That's absolutely acceptable here. But you won't see us taking money to put uh, some CEO on the front cover. Mm -hmm. We're not doing that kind of stuff. It just doesn't make sense. There's plenty of that out there. So we're doing it a little bit differently. And because of that, all of the pressure, all of the like, intense stuff that might come along with that such money focused thing is not here. It doesn't exist. We actually have fun. I'm not shitting you. Uh, this past Sunday, working with Caitlin, six hours, throwing together the last piece of what we call the flat plan, laying out everything that the, the magazine is going to be by single, you know, every single page, what it's going to look like, what's going to be on there, blah, 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 the design of it, all of that stuff. We spent six hours together, laughed our asses off, and had a great time doing it, you know, and, and, and pulling this magazine together. So it's more like that because of the community, because of the nature of the magazine itself and, and our focus. We don't have the pressurized money aspect of it. And so the hard stuff that a lot of people think that might exist when you create a magazine or a publication like this. It's just not there, at least not for me. I'm not stressed over it, or maybe I just smoke too much fucking weed. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'll tell you something, it does come across and it comes across in the quality of the content. And you know, that's ultimately what it comes down to, right? Awesome. Uh, I love to hear have, that, dude. You you had an article, um, uh, Natalie Goldberg just wrote an article on uh, August. 6th I love her. About Isn't she the fun? Kushkan uh, cannabis, which I was trying to get information. I looked all over the place trying to find somebody to tell me what the hell happened down at Kushkan. And boom, here is. Did you get what you needed? 
Yes, exactly what I needed. I needed somebody to take a perspective and walk through the place and look at all of the beautiful information that she provided and her take. I didn't need to take my take or the commercial take or anybody else's. She was looking at it from a curing standpoint. You and got a personal through. perspective and that's Boom. what we're doing here. Yes. And it's not an opinion piece, right? It's a personal perspective. It's actually, it's almost as if you have uh, someone with their phone walking through, right? That's, yes. It's that kind of stuff. Exactly. God, I love it. Now, I want to go back to something because you mentioned it and you kind of skipped over it a little bit in the beginning. And you talked about your heritage. And uh, that was another one of the things that kind of connected, I connected with you is I was reading one of your posts talking about you growing up in, uh, in, in an indigenous family. And I had an indigenous stepfather for nine years. Yeah. Tell me what that was about. And uh, also, was there, um, I'm curious about the spiritual side as much as I am about the, what kind of cool things you were smoking. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I think now remember I was young. Okay. So let's, okay. so, you know, let's remember that's probably some of the exact details that I would like to know. I probably don't have because as a kid, you don't quite know what your parents are doing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So from my perspective, um, you know, being with or having an indigenous stepfather for nine years, we lived in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, that's where I spent the first 10 years of my life. Wow. Um, a lot of it was focused around family. A lot of the, what I would consider the spiritual side of things was focused heavily on music, heavily on music. I watched my stepfather, I almost said his name. I didn't want to do that because I don't, you know, anyway, yeah, got um, it. Uh, he's actually a, a, a leader in the state of Missouri in indigenous indigenous uh, circles, cultures, something to have to do with the actual state at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so focused a, a lot around music and I watched him for nine years, hours a day, play mandolin, at, at, like at, constantly. Mandolin. And I, man, a mandolin. And it was something that was, uh, I think it was very profound on my life. As you can see, I have string instruments, you know. Yeah. Uh, it was very profound on my life, I think. Also, we had two, if I remember correctly, two walls in our house completely filled with records. So music was a driving force from my earliest childhood memories, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, what he was ever smoking or what my parents were ever smoking. I have no idea. Um, but I can remember times where, um, you know, a, a lot of, I guess, interaction with the plant. We'll just focus on that. Um, there, I, it was so different back then. It was so nonchalant back in the late seventies and early eighties. I was born in 75, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, it was just a lot different. And I guess, again, it was always so normal that it would, it's so normal that my brother and I, I can remember a time where my, my brother and I were in the back seat of the car, brother and me, brother and I, I was, no, whatever. Uh, we were in the back seat of the car and my parents are handing a joint back and forth smoking, you know, and my brother, is, he's six years older than me. We're back there elbowing each other going, <laughs> you know, and laughing and being stupid and silly. So it was just very different back then. And I think, both having um, a military portion of the family was different, mm, that's especially, right. especially um, so many of them in my family are military and they are all smokers, right? They're like hippie military folks, but they're <laughs> hunters and stuff like that. So my family was always so different, man. Yeah. Um, and I think that really had a, a, a huge impact on obviously who I became, which is sort of that... Um, I guess, underground or and underdog and subculture lover that I've always been. So, wow. yeah. That's so cool, dude. And, and, and I also, you know, one other thing that that, and I, I don't know why I just sometimes forget about this and tend to skip over it, but I think also the way that I grew up influenced the things that I, I love so much that Standing Rock became a big thing for me. Right. Yeah. 
And that was my next question with Standing Rock. Oh, because, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of how I got involved and what happened. Let me get a uh, little drink here. Yeah, no, please, please do. So, so back in, I, yeah, I, I, uh, water. <laughs> <laughs> water. Um, so back, I think this was in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we were seeing sort of reports of some indigenous cultures, indigenous peoples fighting against a pipeline called the Dakota Access Pipeline that they, that this company was, um, and I, I cannot remember the name of the company offhand, uh, but anyway, they were building pipeline through, really what happened was the pipeline was scheduled or set and drawn up. It was designed to actually run through the city of um, Bismarck, North Dakota, or very close to it, let's just say that. And a lot of people um, of a certain skin color like myself were not happy about that and decided to push to have that changed. Well, they changed it to indigenous lands and running through um, you know, some very sacred burial places. So that's a problem, right? And so they have a right to stand up for their rights on their land. And I see nothing wrong with that, um, especially because of, you know, if it's not good enough in my backyard, why is it good enough in their backyard? Exactly. And a lot of people like to argue, you know, you're, you're fighting against the building of a pipeline. That's the best way to move oil, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know what? It, it, it is efficient, right? Money. But is it the best? No, because it fucking leaks every day we have a leak in this country still mm -hmm. every day anybody ever wants to look it up do so mm -hmm. so is it really the best no unless your focus is money which of course hey welcome to the to, to america right welcome to the u.s so after this was going on for for months at a time and we saw all of these reports of these indigenous people on their own land um, on the uh, in Standing Rock, um, just being bashed, you know, getting their asses kicked, to be honest with you, by paid police forces, by the state, by the way, the state was paying these police forces to come in and rubber bullet, arrest, um, yeah. you know, all kinds of just terrible shit. So, more and more people started going, you know what, this is not right. We don't want the fucking oil pipeline. And oh, and here's another thing. They were digging underneath the Missouri River to run this pipeline as yeah. well. Yeah. And hello, the Missouri River, are you kidding me? Yeah. That's what feeds our crops, dude. I mean, Jesus Christ, give me a break. I mean, how much money is enough? Seriously, how much is enough? So they got all of our support, at least everybody that I know in this world, totally, I mean, really that I know, totally supported, you know, the indigenous folks on their own land fighting back against this company that had the backing of the state and the federal government for the most part. Yeah. So I was like, nah, I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm not, I'm not sitting around and not doing something. I don't, it hit me, I guess, because again, it, my, I would assume had something to do with my childhood. So a friend of mine and, uh, and, and myself, we did a fundraiser and we, we got this tent outside of our favorite bar in downtown Atlanta called the Earl. And we promoted the shit out of it. And we said, please come drop off your stuff. Um, we're, we're, we'll take tents, clothes, um, you know, food, fuel, camping equipment, anything and everything you got, we're going to take it up there and we're going to fucking help. We're going to do whatever we can, you know, and we're kind of being stupid and naive, but at the same time, we're, we're stoked because we just want to help period. Yeah, we just sure. want to fucking help. I have no, no other thing going on at this point, other than work to, to, to support. And I jumped at the chance. So we ended up getting a truck and trailer full of supplies from our community here in Atlanta, which blew us away. And then almost another $4,000 in cash on top of that in two days. I almost shit my pants. I was wow. like, oh my God, what the hell did we do? This is so rad. We drove from Atlanta to Cannonball, North Dakota, went um, 
directly to Standing Rock. We didn't know where the hell we were really going, but we, we saw some stuff and we pulled off on the side of the road. We went down this ditch. And the next thing you know, we're in this camp called Red Butt. And two white dudes in a truck and a trailer just pulled up into a camp with indigenous only basically people. Mm -hmm. And the looks on their faces were like, what the fuck are they doing here? Right? And they started to, I'm not kidding. I mean, cause they have people looking out and you know, all of that stuff because of what's going on, like cops yeah. trying to get in and all that kind of stuff. But we just drove right up in there because we actually had a fucking purpose to be there. Right. And I yeah. wasn't scared. My, my buddy bird definitely wasn't scared. Yeah. Um, so they started walking toward us and we were like, okay, well let's park and get out and just, you know, see what's up, you know? And, and next thing you know, I said, Hey, y'all, we're, you know, I'm Dex, by the way, that Dex is my, uh, is my nickname that I've had since I was like 14 years old. Got it. Um, I was like, I'm Dex, this is Bird. We introduced ourselves. We said, we got something for y'all. And we opened up the back and we were like, here you go. Here's everything that you could ever need. Oh, and by the way, you tell us whatever else you need, because we're going to use our, our whiteness basically <laughs> um, to, to drive from here to Bismarck, which is about an hour away to get any other supplies that you need with the $4,000 we have. So we bought loads of other shit axes. We had chainsaws. We had all kinds of stuff, dude. And That's we awesome. loaded up that camp so that they could fight for the rest of the year. And this was around October. Things were getting cold. It was already, you know, it blew. I don't know if you've ever been to North Dakota or even South Dakota, but no, the you. wind is 40 miles an hour and, and all the time, that's zero, 40 miles an hour all the time. Mm. And these winds gust like, you know, to 60 and 70 miles an hour all the time. Mm. So you're on the Missouri River camping out at this Redbud camp. All of these people have, are warm and accepting and they're like, holy shit, thank you so much for helping us. What the hell are you two white dudes doing here from Atlanta? <laughs> You're three days away from here, dude. What the fuck's going on? And we were like, we just wanted to help because this is bullshit. And yeah. the one thing they wouldn't let us do was actually go to the front lines and fight, like be in the river and, and you know, fighting off the actual people that were trying to dig right. because that was actively going on and the cops were there and that's where the rubber bullets were and all that kind of shit. And they were arresting people constantly. They sort of protected us, to be honest with you. And we're like, we're, you know, we're not going to let you go there. You're here. You help us here. So we helped cook. We helped set up tents. We did all of, we chopped wood, all of that kind of shit. Um, it was one of the dopest things I've ever done in my life. Um, okay. And it changed me profoundly from that day on. I've looked at a lot of things very differently from, the, from that point. I will post the picture up here uh, on our, our screen of uh, you sitting with Curly. Ah, yes. He, he really let you, so, he brought you in. Yeah. So Curly was the Red Bud Camp leader. Um, he was the coolest dude. Uh, I swear for weeks after we, when we left, when I, when Bird and I would talk about our, our, our travel, we would hear his voice. Wow. Like a, a very uh, distinct, profound, manly, uh, safe, comforting voice um, very spiritual dude told us about this which I didn't believe told us this story about this hawk that had come into the camp and spoke to them and sat with them and he gathered around the children and they had stories with the hawk mm. and I thought he was just telling us a story I'm not fucking bullshitting you he then sent me he texted me a picture of him a hawk on the fence next to him and everybody else surrounded. And I was like, oh, you, that wasn't a story. That was real. And, uh, and so um, it was that guy, Curly, was one of the coolest people I've ever met in my life, man. Mm. I, am, I am very intrigued by this, uh, all of these stories. I had family that were a part of the uh, Trail of Tears and uh, going going way back. Um, and yeah. so I'm, I'm always uh, thrilled to hear any opportunities that like you had where you were able to get in uh, inside, uh, you know. It's very a, rare. It's, it is. It's, and, and, and honestly, I still don't know what allowed them or, or allowed us in. I think 
again, my very nature normally is to be sort of open and welcoming as much as I can and supportive. I'm not like a very combative person. You know, I try not to be, I don't, I don't want to be that person. I, I try not to be an asshole. So I try not to wear it on my face, even though it doesn't always work. <laughs> it doesn't, that's not always the case. But um, I think once they, once we opened that trailer, I think all of their, like, who the fuck are these guys went away, you know, and, and we had nothing, but we're here to help. That was it. And That's I think, awesome. you know, when you look at us, first of all, my buddy Birdsong, Chris Birdsong, um, one of the, he's my best friend. He's one of the greatest filmmakers in the world. That's who I worked with in the industry, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, if you're ever interested in looking up his IMBD account, you'll see all of the amazing things he's worked on over the past 15 years or so. What was the biggest uh, thing you guys worked on? Oh, God. We did, uh, so we did Godzilla vs. Kong. The one that came out, <clears throat> excuse me, came out last year. Oh, uh, we did the banker with Samuel L. Jackson, Anthony Mackie, Nicholas Holt. Uh, we did Facebook's first ever series with uh, Catherine. Uh, I'm sorry, with Catherine Zeta Jones called Queen America. We did um, uh, something that just came out not too long ago called Last Looks with Mel Gibson, Charlie Hunnam, and a slew of other dope people. Um, dude, we've done so much. I think I did like maybe 16 or so uh, productions in, in the three, three and a half, four years, whatever it was that I was there. Mm -hmm. But Bird himself, um, and I've known Bird for over way over half my life at this point. Um, he has done, I mean, he did Hidden Figures. Uh, I mean, he's done some of the, the greatest, I mean, he did Thor, Ragnarok. I mean, he, he did some of the, he's done some of the greatest films over the past 15 years. He really has. Um, I mean, the Anita, Anita Hill story, you know, just a lot of cool stuff. We did the Bobby Brown story together, you know, mm -hmm. we're here in Atlanta, right? And by the way, Atlanta's a, a hotbed for, for the industry at this point. You know, we do all Absolutely. of the Marvel stuff and uh, we do a lot of stuff down here. Uh, one of my pre uh, pre uh, jobs uh, uh, before I was in the cannabis industry is uh, I had a company that did a lot of work in the entertainment industry and I worked for a lot of producers and directors and set up a lot of a million different, uh, you know, all of the uh, peripheral details for cast and crew whenever they were shooting. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you what. I there's a lot of entertainment people in the cannabis industry because, you know, obviously a lot of us are um, a little bit, we, we, we've kind of gone against the grain a little bit, I guess, and sort of artsy sometimes, but tend to not want to follow some of the rules or maybe we didn't get our college education. Maybe some of us did, blah, blah, blah. So you see a lot of the same misfits from yes. <laughs> the film industry as you do in the cannabis industry. I love it. Well, I know one of the people that I worked for, I'm sure you're going to know. And uh, the reason why I know this is because uh, of your profile picture that I'm using for the showrunner is uh, the one where you are uh, kind of using one of the images of this guy, of Gonzo. That is Hunter Thompson. Oh, without yeah, a yeah, Hunter S. Thompson, oh. yes. One of my favorite pipes, by the way. Thank you very That's much. <laughs> love my dope, Hunter dude. Thompson. Love my Hunter Thompson pipe. So yeah. the guy that uh, I was working for was Robert Evans. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. Go, what were you stuff, doing? Uh, well, I did everything for him. You would be. Just, we'll we'll have that's a whole nother interview that Fair we can enough. things i i mean i could i could tell you probably a hundred stories about him uh that are okay. all and everybody is all told the stories that you heard about him are all true he is ac absolutely that guy that character and he I had bet. the the most amazing hollywood hills home and he lost it and he got it back and went bankrupt and lost oh everything he's one of those guys and it sounds he, like the industry yes and he knew everybody so you know every yeah. phone call and he had this very distinctive voice so that you know uh, uh whenever he called you on the phone it was like god was calling you on the phone. <laughs> and uh he, very I, cool he, dude a lot of i love fun. the backgrounds dude i was you know i posted something the other day on linkedin about our backgrounds right like what were you doing before you got in the cannabis industry yeah. I honestly love to hear it because 
you know, everybody's got a different story to tell, you know, and it's, it's always fun. And that's a part, that's another thing about being in cannabis media and having a publication is we get to tell all these kind of different stories from everybody. And it's, it's just rad, dude. And, and it, it's not all filled with, you know, stuff that has a, uh, like, you're not trying to get anything from it, right? You're not trying no. to gain anything from it. Mm. It doesn't have an ulterior motive. No. It's just speaking from the heart and, and, and hearing people's stories. So just that post from yesterday and seeing some of the things, all yes. the different things and that people do and, and reading some of those stories, it's fucking rad, man. That's I crazy. It. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got fat nugs. Are we going to have fresh mushrooms in there <laughs> as well? That's a good question, man. So I think there might be something coming up in the September edition. We'll just say that. How about, how about that? Without giving up too much information, we'll, uh, we'll say something along those lines. All right. Fantastic. Only, so only two weeks to wait. Only two weeks. That's a great pipe, by the way, dude. I'm Cheers. sure in your honor. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have a, a slew, like a really cool, um, you know, collection of all kinds of, yeah, I figure. <laughs> Captain Hooter, Captain Hooter yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, right. and Gonzo get to hang out together all the time. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a very large collection of, uh, of assorted pipes and I love trying new toys and new, uh, um, new uh, types of products. Oh yeah. Who um, doesn't? Who doesn't? Let me ask you, because I, I, I know that, uh, again, you're, you're kind of fresh to this uh, to a certain extent, but. Oh, very. Are, are you going to be doing a lot of uh, uh, specific type of reporting about some of the new types of things that are coming out, like uh, THCO or THCP, which is now like one of the hot undercurrents right now for all of sure. those that are in the know that's like right or now. the hhc or you know whatever yes yeah um yeah of course um there'll be times where we do have specific sort of sciencey angles about that stuff mm -hmm. but also try to get somewhat of a personal um you know here let me let me let me tell you this so today i was contacted by somebody that had some questions about hhc and would it possibly show up on a drug screen? And I said, there's no real studies at this point or examples that you can point to that aren't personal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I really can't help in that arena, right? So, but having the knowledge that there are people out there that we can reach out to and get a personal sort of um, or anecdotal evidence of mm -hmm. what their experience with HHC is like, that would help us. And yeah. that's the angle that we're trying to come from. So yes, okay. we want science and education. We want fun, funny, silly, stupid, you know, different kind of stuff, but we all want it to have a very personal touch to it because what really connects us is each other, right? So if you have something that's running through that article, that's not just, hey, did you know? It has to have some sort of feeling to it, some fucking meat, dude. Yes. Otherwise, you know, look, I can go and read Forbes all day long. Yay. But, you know, it's, it's not. It's, don't get me wrong. Forbes has its place and they do great stuff. Yeah. But does it get me like, oh, yeah, that's what I did last Saturday night. I remember, you know, it doesn't get me remembering things and giving and giving me those feelings of, of old days or am I learning something new in a way that connects with me personally and it's not just speaking at me it's speaking with me I'm having a conversation with the piece that I'm reading I can put myself there so when you're reading a book you get taken somewhere else not into a fucking classroom we want a personal right. touch we want our articles to take us somewhere right and you want to fall what i'm dying to do is to actually have some content providers that i want to follow that are creating consistent high quality content on a yep. regular basis that you yep. can count on so you know when uh, uh jessica riley talks about uh what's going on in new york you yep. know that okay yep that, and that was about her the indigenous culture stuff in new york yeah um, I, uh, by the way, Jessica is one of my favorite writers in the cannabis industry, all transparency. She's fucking yes. killer. Yes, she is. 
Yeah, I have a list. I have a list of really great writers, by the way. So if anybody out there that watches this um, needs a writer, reach out to me. I have great writers that, you know, and, and I, I say this all the time, collaboration over competition all day long for me. I don't care uh, if you're another media company. I support you. So if you ever need anything, I'm like, yeah, I have tons of writers. I would love to be able to help. As a matter of fact, I'm working with a, a cannabis beverage company sort of through Fat Nugs, but personally wanted to have something to do with it as well to help with something really cool that's coming up in the month of October. So, you know, I'm trying to do things in a collaborative way. And if I can ever shout out writers and creators um, all day long, I will. That's awesome. Okay, so now uh, can we can we take this all the way to the end of the line? And since there was a High Times Cannabis Cup, can we expect there's going to be a Fat Nugs magazine cannabis you know cup? What? Right that's, a, that's a funny question because I have had this conversation several times already, <laughs> uh, and I've started to mull it over. Things with this magazine are sort of going at its own speed, right? Sometimes I am uh, pushing, and sometimes I'm like, "Oh my God, please slow down." <laughs> so I think that eventually I would like to get to the point as we get more advertising and sponsorship dollars coming in and I can pay more and more people to do things because at this time we're not making any money. Mm -hmm. This is, this is built from scratch, from the dirt mm -hmm. by the community. None of us have made a penny off of this thing. Yeah. We're doing this because it's passion. We love to do it. I spend hours doing it every week to create mm -hmm. this stuff to be able to amplify voices that we love to hear, to push the plant, to uplift the plant. So as we continue to bring in advertising and sponsorship dollars, which I believe we will, and there'll be some things that I announce here over the next week or two um, that will kind of confirm some of that. Uh, so as that happens, we will definitely start exploring options for shows and expos and cannabis cups and supporting as many people and farmers and whatever we I would love to have a farmers a fat nugs farmers market to be honest mm. with you if I mean how yes. dope would that be I would love to be able to provide killer spaces for cannabis people to do cannabis stuff why not so whatever I can get involved with eventually I'm sure I will have you know uh open arms to it but as of right now, it's just been conversations and people like, hey, you know where you can take this? Hey, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which well, is cool. I, Which is, you know what, that's that's the coolest part is that people, people they just want to be a part of this. And I just want to be a part of them wanting to be a part of this, you know? So it, again, it's just a community. It's mm -hmm. so everybody has a voice here. It's like, if you have an idea, throw it at us. Yeah. Let's see what we can do with it. And that's sort of how we've approached this. Luckily, a lot of people in the cannabis industry are extremely intelligent and they're passionate people. So you get high quality content from a lot of really cool people that you would never think could, could provide that stuff. Mm -hmm. So yes, all of our writers, most of our writers are, are and have been writing in this industry for a good bit and do so on a regular basis. But we also have people that we're amplifying that never had that chance either. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is um it, the, this has been a, a really cool thing to be a part of. And as this thing grows, I can't wait to to have a fat nugs cannabis cup. I, I if I could do that, um dreams come true, right? I mean, Jesus, yeah. what in the hell? I mean, even this magazine, I, I never thought in a million years, I was just texting my buddy this morning, uh, actually a couple of my buddies, because I saw for the first time yesterday, the printed version, yeah. right? I was yeah. like, oh my God, this is an actual thing. I can't believe this. And I, 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 I was texting them and I was like, I, I never in a million years thought that I would you know, the, the, the weed guy you all have always known would have this opportunity to create a publication that focuses on our cannabis and stoner culture to be a bridge to corporate culture. And I think it's just um, sort of unbelievable at this point. And honestly, I fight that. Uh, what is that? That um, what do they call that? Uh, when you're uh, you're not quite sure that you could be doing this imposter syndrome, oh, okay. um, you know, yeah, yeah. sort of fight that imposter syndrome. Because again, 
four and a half months in or five months in, whatever it's been, of course, you know, I'm kind of like, holy shit, this is, if I do this right, if we do this right, this can be something that people can actually enjoy for a long time, grasp onto, be a part of, build a community around, have fun times around it, you know, and, and it's just something that I never thought I'd be able to do. So I'm super grateful, to be honest with you, and I'm blown away on a daily basis by the, the killer people I get to work with, talk to, have fun with, smoke with. Um, I'm super lucky, dude. I'm like the happiest I've ever been in my life, but I also know that all of this shit can come crashing down. So the only thing I tend to try and focus on is being positive and grateful yes. and just keep doing my thing, dude. Blessings. Blessings, man. Yes. That is something, you know, and, and, um, it's, it's very interesting. It, uh, I've had all of these amazing interviews over the last six months with some of the biggest names, the largest, you know, uh, the largest uh, uh, distributor in the world, one of the largest seed companies, these legends, you know, back and forth. And we're all working for the plant. Every one of us in all of our different ways. And every single one of us have, have this passion, this internal passion about the plant. And the thing about you, dude, is, you know, moths gather around the light. And, you know, you're, you're a, a blinding light right now. And, uh, you know, it, it drew me in. I immediately started doing the deep dive on what you've been doing. And I think you're uh, destined for greatness. And I think that Fat Nugs Magazine is destined for greatness. And I, I really appreciate you coming here and telling me a little bit more about this. And I'm going to tell the world about Fat Nugs. And I can't wait to see what's coming up next. Man, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, way too many kind words. I appreciate it. Um, I, I Obviously, it's not just me. There's a ton of us doing this shit. But thank you very much, man. It means a lot. Um, it's crazy to be in this spot. And I really appreciate, appreciate you having me on here today. Thank you. And I have one more exception to the rule also. Normally, we do a playlist. And today, we're going to do two playlists because I want okay. your playlist still. And you can we'll, we'll throw that on there. But I also want to remind people that Fat Nugs Magazine also has a playlist already on Spotify. And I've already been on it. And it's a fucking ride, kid. So <laughs> I'm just telling you right now. Uh, oh, ready. it's so funny. Oh. So funny. So he, he I, when you tell me it goes from Peter Tosh to Patsy Klein, I'm like, yep, absolutely. <laughs> and and um, I did put, like I said earlier, like probably a hundred songs or so on there to when we first started it. But as we get new contributors, just to explain how it works real quick, yeah. as we get new contributors, we say, hey, if you want to join our Spotify playlist, come on and put yourself on as a contributor. You're more than welcome to upload some songs. And so you get such a wide variety because we have about 31 or 32 contributors and writers so far that have worked with us and it, the wide range. I mean, you'll get punk to, again, Patsy Klein to, I mean, anything that anything and everything that you can think of. Man. And it's so it's, it's, entertaining. It's so it entertaining. Is. It goes, it is. Right, what, wait, what? Yeah. You know what's <laughs> funny? There's a guy named there's a grower. Um, his name is Glenn Holland. You might know him, you might not. Yeah, you should connect with him okay. uh, on LinkedIn. But he's built this grid. He's called it Ganja Grid. And it's to put over your plants and they're, they're touching the grid. And he runs music or, or, or voice or whatever through the grid and oh. it vibrates the plants. Oh, and it's, God. and he, it was actually in the, the, um, the July edition. It was one of the last articles in the July edition. And it. it's phenomenal what he does but he every once in a while he'll, he'll shoot me a video on, on instagram where he's using our playlist to grow his plants and, and vibrate it's it's hilarious dude i love it that is mind-blowing i'm trying to think about what i mean what if you had like nothing but slam rock on something yeah. as opposed to listening to brahms or exactly dude he's the man to talk to about that he really oh, is yeah and he's such a nice dude dude he's a cancer survivor he's a really great guy he's very supportive Somebody you should definitely connect with. Blessings. Thank you. I will definitely get in touch with him. That sounds fascinating. I love it. Thank you again for joining me. And um, uh, we will stay in touch with you and um, all of your writers. You have so many fantastic writers. So I'm hoping to get some of the writers on the show as well. Love it. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. Enjoy your weekend, man. You too. See you next right. time. Dude, what did I tell you? Is that something else? This man 
I'm telling you, he's another one of those people who we're going to be reading about and, you know, lifetime achievement award winners and all that kind of stuff. It's just going to be a matter of time. So I guess I'll just be sitting here staring at my pictures. Oh, wait a second. Hit it. Life is good. Life is good. Captain Hooter, I found something. You're going to want to hear about it. You know what? I'm not going to just going to tell you about it. I'm I'm going to make you guess. So here's a hint. I found something that is a rarity in the the legal marketplace. Um, you can find this uh, a little bit more easily if you're well connected in the legacy markets. Um, but I'll be honest, it's you're just as likely to just learn how to do it yourself and do it at home if you're uh, kind of like a home processor kind of do it yourselfer. Uh, so, uh, so I guess the first hint is this is a rarity in the legal. U.S., but probably worldwide marketplace. That's the first hint. Yeah, you're not going to guess. The second hint is it is small. It is concealable. It is battery powered. And... Um, <clears throat> The label says love muffin. That's true. Um, that doesn't help, does it? No, I, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Okay, the last the last hint is is kind of a reach, but I think that only you, Captain, are going to get this one. The last hint is simply this. Space Mountain. I hope I got it right. As I recall, you told a story about a family trip to Disneyland. I think it was Disneyland. Um, and a certain item that you were able to carry with you that made the trip a whole lot more enjoyable because you were able to elevate on Space Mountain on any ride. You could make any ride Space Mountain if you wanted to because you are high. But uh, you might have taken this actually to Space Mountain, and it might have taken you to Space Mountain while you were on Space Mountain, which is an exponential usage of Space Mountain. And I think you probably are able to guess what I'm talking about. Whoop. Whoop, over here. Now this actually says live hash resin pod, and that's a typo. This is a live hash rosin, spelled with an O, rosin pod. It says it on all the other places, confirmed to the company. This is a typo because this is how rare this is. Archive is the brand, that's how you pronounce it. And look at this little beauty. This is a half gram rechargeable live hash rosin pod. Well, let's just talk about some of the low profile, some of the concealability of what this is. So first of all, does this look like a weed pen, a weed cartridge? Does this look like a, a hash pen? Does this look like a threaded something or other? Does this look like a dab? Does this look like, what does this look like? This just looks like nothing unless you're looking close. It's really nondescript. And I mean, it just looks like a vape pen, um, but it's not obnoxious. There's nothing loud about this. 
Um, this has, uh, so like I mentioned, a rechargeable BYOC, bring your own cord. Um, I don't know what the hit limit is on the, on the charge. They recommend that you keep this charged up. Um, and I do, uh, I've never done it. I know that there's a 10 second hit limit on the, the thing. The, this will light up and it'll start blinking at 10 seconds and the hit stops. It's not a huge hit, but it's a nice hit. Um, it's not a huge cloud. It's a low profile cloud. When you exhale that cloud, it's not so full of flavor that everybody in the room knows that, whoa, hey, blueberry. Mm -mm, it's modest. Um, the flavors I would categorize primarily as blueberry and pine. Um, it's, they're, it's, they're, they're, they're well mingled. Um, they're not distinctly like, oh, it's a blueberry beginning and a pine finish. But there is more of like an earthy, uh, hashy, a little bit funky, but I'll stick with earthy finish to it. Um, it's a mild flavor. Um, so this is manufactured by Archive, R-K-I-V-E, um, <clears throat> which I believe is part of maybe uh, a larger group of, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a vertical business, I believe. Um, where they do their own cultivation. They've got their own cultivation groups, processing, um, and then retail uh, through Allswell. I got this at Allswell, which is a medical provisioning center here in Michigan. Um, this is not one that's open to the public as a recreational also. It was located in Traverse City. I bought this a couple weeks ago, so I know that they're sold out because this is one of the last ones they had, and I was kind of lucky to get it. It was on the shelves for a week, um, and these things do not last. They go quick. Half gram. There's only half gram in here. Uh, I think pre-tax is around 45 bucks. Um, in a disposable pod, you can't reload this or fill it. I mean, I'm sure if you're one hell of a do-it-yourself or you could, but it's not worth it. Modest clouds. Nice flavor. Um, the funny side is I was smoking so much blueberry <laughs> buds that when I first got this, I didn't taste the blueberry. I got the piney, I got like this pithy, bitter, um, herbal kind of thing going, but I was smoking some very strongly blueberry buds and my, and, and also blueberries are in season here in Michigan. So I've been eating a ton of fresh ones. I couldn't taste the blueberries in this. So uh, some discerning taste, taste buds. I know, uh, I let them try it and they agreed that their blueberry and pine were, were there. Um, I got off the blueberry for a little bit and, uh, and tried it and sure enough, you know, it's there. It's just mild, you know, it's a, it's a nice flavor. So, um, what else can I say? This was manufactured by Archive here in Michigan. Um, Archive is, is proving to be a, a brand of product that I really like their hash rosins. I like their buds. They've had some nice buds that I've tried. Um, and, um, I don't know, I'll certainly follow them, but this is a rarity in the marketplace. Captain, I knew that you would be interested in this because this is a rarity. So this is something that I'm gonna keep out of the sunlight. I'm gonna keep it in cool temperatures. I'm gonna keep it charged up. Um, and I'm gonna save this for more special occasions when I need to be super low profile. Thanks, Captain. Talk to you soon. Peace. Thank you for listening. Wow, what a great review that was. Dude, Matt, his style is so smooth and so entertaining. He can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich sound awesome. Anyway, listen, I love you guys. I can't wait to see you again. I'll see you back on Wednesday for a brand new Wake and Bake.
It's Captain Hooter. Far out, man.